আর লাউ যখন নিয়ে আসবেন আমি তিনটে লাউ They often resort to sex work for short periods of time, for long periods of time, as and when the need arises uh, within their lifespans. And for the most part, sex workers around the world agree that the preferred policy position would be decriminalization, which is that sex work should not be treated in an exceptional way in relation to other occupations, 
and that therefore sex workers should be subject to the same laws that other workers in other occupations are subject to. Therefore, they would ask for the repeal of specific anti-sex work uh, criminal laws. Now, in the Indian context, this uh, you know, presentation of these two polarized camps becomes a little bit more complicated because in fact, with the presence of a very strong left in India, many feminists uh, derive their um, you know, feminist thinking from various strands of Marxist and materialist feminism. So they often have a very ambivalent position vis-a-vis -vis sex work. On the one hand, they really believe in the Marxist idea that marriage is a site of exploitation for women, including sexual exploitation, and therefore marriage is not an unqualified good. So now if you look at the radical feminists, they don't problematize marriage as much at all anymore. They instead focus on sex work as being on the outside of marriage and therefore um, you know, the site of violence, whereas marriage then becomes legitimized in their thinking. On the other hand, um, so, so for a lot of Indian feminists, uh, they actually take seriously the Marxist critique of marriage, but at the same time, they also recognize that sex workers in India take to sex work under conditions of poverty and economic coercion, like many sections of society. And therefore, they are for the rights of sex workers, but not the right to sex work. And there are some Marxist feminists who would actually agree with the radical feminists that it's a form of violence and that we shouldn't support it. So they've always had this very ambivalent relationship in relation to sex work. Of late, there has been much more feminist solidarity with the sex workers movement, thanks to the efforts of groups like DMSC and Sangram and you know, the various sex worker organizations all over the country. But more or less, I think there is a sort of middle ground feminism uh, that is a bit ambivalent about uh, sex work itself as an occupational choice. And for a very long period, there has also been deep contestations amongst feminists, especially Dalit feminists who claim that, you know, uh, who want to ask who exactly are the sex workers? What, what is their caste profile? And why are women from lower caste invariably in sex work? And they're right that this is a matter that's not been studied empirically enough. Uh, and so there is also deep debate um, from the Dalit feminist perspective of whether, you know, sex work, or allied forms of sexual entertainment, such as bar dancing, can in fact be legitimized as a form of livelihood when in fact lower caste women uh, form the majority in their view of the women who take to these occupations. So I'll next move on to the question of prostitution laws. Now again here, there's a very long history of anti-trafficking laws at the international level that actually determine the form of uh, prostitution law that any particular country adopts. Now, as you all know, in the Indian context, we had post-independence, the Suppression of Immoral Traffic Act in 1956, which is amended in 1986 to increase certain penalties. Now, what is fascinating about these, and I don't call these prostitution laws, I think of them as anti-sex work laws. So I just want to clarify my use of terminology here. Often the, uh, the propensity to amend anti-sex work criminal laws often comes from some major shock or some major trigger. Either it's a health trigger, um, or it is, you know, uh, a, a case like, uh, you know, the Delhi rape and murder of Jyoti Pandey. So there are often external triggers for pushing law reform in this area. So the first trigger emerges in the late 80s after the discovery of HIV in, in Chennai. And uh, there was some discussion around law reform at that point. Uh, in fact, the National Law School of India, Bangalore, in the early 1990s was asked to rethink, uh, you know, anti-sex or criminal laws. And many proposals that came for that, that point actually were not, did not make it into any a serious proposal. And then you have the National Commission for Women, which is formed in uh, the mid 1990s, which immediately looks at the question of prostitution. And so there is again discussion around, you know, how should we uh, implement any law reform to the ITPA, but again, it does not materialize. Um, instead, what we have is in, uh, you know, the, with the adoption of the trafficking protocol or the Palermo protocol, as it's often called, in 2000, you see a flurry of uh, reform around sex work laws, and this is all over the world. Um, so in addition to the adoption of the Palermo protocol, you also have the U.S. domestic law, the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act, under which the State Department can essentially rank countries around the world in terms of their action against trafficking. So when India stayed on the tier two watch list for several years, the Indian government decided to amend the ITPA and they resorted to the Swedish model to criminalize customers of sex workers. Now, by this point, there were HIV prevention NGOs all over the country that had done some very important work in terms of recognizing sex workers as agents of change, not just as victims of sexual violence or oppression. 
And so there was a, a deep dissonance within the union government on this amendment. You had the health ministry, which was opposed to the amendment because it would essentially unwind all the good work that they had done on HIV protection, uh, prevention. And then you had the home ministry, which was very keen on the amendment. And uh, with the protests of sex workers against the amendment, actually that amendment lapsed. So the next point of reform was triggered, as I said, by the murder of uh, Jyoti Pandey in 2013, where the Verma committee, uh, very unfortunately, uh, claimed you know, uh, that there should be a trafficking offense, which then conflates voluntary prostitution with trafficking. And thankfully, to the, uh, thanks to the efforts of feminist lawyers from the Indian women's movement, but also groups such as the National Network of Sex Workers, uh, this, there was a huge pushback against this provision. And instead, we have a trafficking offense in the IPC, uh, which is not just confined to, to sex work, but has dropped that formulation of trafficking and voluntary prostitution being on par or being the same, being one and the same. Um, but in the meantime, a lot of abolitionist NGOs around the country, which had been litigating for protection of the rights of trafficking victims, um, had launched uh, public interest lawsuits. And one of them came up before the Supreme Court, uh, where the Supreme Court dismissed uh, the case, this was filed by Prajwala, uh, an abolitionist group, on the condition that the Ministry of Women and Child Development actually introduced uh, a law on trafficking. And so we have a trafficking bill that comes up in 2016, which is deeply flawed. Uh, and there are further iterations of this bill. And in fact, the 2018 version of the bill was passed by the Lok Sabha. And it lapsed uh, before it could be considered by the Rajya Sabha. Now this, I've written extensively about it. I won't uh, bore you with all the details of the trafficking bill, but to say the very least, it was a highly draconian law, which on the face of it, uh, the then minister, uh, um, you know, Menaka Gandhi claimed that it would not affect sex workers at all, that voluntary sex work would de facto be exempt from the legislation, except that the trafficking bill never actually said that in its uh, word or in its spirit. If anything, it simply channeled the spirit of the ITPA right. into the trafficking bill and simply used provisions such as a closure of brothels then to apply to all sectors where there might be traffic labor, such as farms, households. So it was quite um, an illogical uh, piece of, of, of legislation. Um, and it is being worked on upon uh, again now and is likely to come up in the near future. So. Uh, one of the most problematic provisions in that bill was the fact that, uh, you know, those who were trafficked, both men and women, could be put away in protection homes and rehabilitation homes against their will. So there's a provision in the trafficking bill of 2018 which says that, you know, a person who is, is trafficked, a victim, could, uh, you know, file a complaint with the judge and say that they did not want to be transferred to a protection home, which would be a short-term um, home. Um, but then the judge could actually reject this request if he or she thought that the victim was being coerced. Now, this is deeply problematic because under the ITPA, we have women who are languishing in these so-called um, you know, care homes for extended periods of time without any access to lawyers, to legal aid, to their family, uh, and often driven to suicide. So this is a deeply problematic provision of the trafficking bill. So I'll speak about this a little bit. Now I'll come to the third part of my presentation, which is under COVID. So clearly, um, you know, COVID uh, has been used as an opportunity by many abolitionist groups to claim that, you know, this would be the best way to get rid of sex work altogether. So there was the infamous Harvard Yale study, which claimed that uh, red light areas were the site for transmission of COVID and that they should be shut down immediately and forever. And one would think that public health experts to, should stick to their area of expertise. Instead, this so-called study actually also offered advice to legislators and said that they should simply rehabilitate sex workers and have them do more dignified work uh, and that for once and for all, sex work should be abolished. Now, uh, sex, the sex workers movement, although there is a popular impression of sex workers as being you know, uh, victims, uh, I'm, I'm very proud to say that the Indian sex workers movement is one of the most uh, the revolutionary movements in the world. And there are many colleagues actually who are attending the webinar who, are, who have also worked mobilizing sex workers who can speak to this. And it's no surprise then that, you know, groups like DMSE have gone uh, to the Supreme Court. And what is very interesting is that DMSE has activated a public interest litigation, for, uh, not a public interest lawsuit. Actually, this was a case in relation to the murder of a sex worker, which uh, Dr. Jana can talk about more. But he was part of the panel that recommended uh, you know, in great detail, the conditions under which sex workers 
can avail of rehabilitation and that they shouldn't be forced to be rehabilitated. So um, uh, both the Lawyers Collective and DMSC have now gone back to that case under which in 2011, there was a direction by the Supreme Court that ration cards be issued to sex workers all over the country, which had been flagrantly uh, not implemented. And so they've used this direction now to ask for two, two sets of demands. One is the distribution of dry ration without having to adduce uh, proof of identity uh, or ration cards for sex workers. And the second set of demands relates to financial aid, which is that a sex worker should be paid 5,000 rupees per month uh, and if they have children, another additional 2,500 rupees for their education. And so the court has, um, you know, now issued a, an order to all state governments to distribute dry ration to sex workers around the country and will now reconsider, you know, how far it has been implemented on the 20th of October. And at that point, they'll also consider the demand for financial aid. And this is a huge victory due to some very creative lawyering on the part of, of DMSC and Lawyers Collective. Now, in the meantime, the National Network of Sex Workers has also gone to the National Human Rights Commission, which has recently issued an advisory to similar effect um, on the rights of women who are subject to the pandemic. And the NHRC has uh, issued this advisory to say that sex workers should be thought of as informal workers. They should have the benefits that other workers have, and that in fact, they should also receive dry ration without having to adduce proof of identity. And then, we finally go to the Bombay High Court uh, uh, decision, which was uh, given in September. Um, really, it emerges from a case uh, from a year ago um, in, in Bombay, where three women who are, the court says, about 19 or 20 years old from the Bidia community, and that they had migrated from UP uh, to do sex work on their own terms in Bombay. And a decoy customer was used, essentially, to you know, entrap one of them. And then the three women had been sent off to uh, uh, a protection home uh, for a year. They'd been detained there for over a year. And their lawyer filed an appeal against the, the orders of the lower courts. Um, and the Bombay High Court very categorically has said what Indian courts have actually said for a very long time, that the selling of sexual services per se is not an offense. In fact, if you read the ITPA very clearly, it's more concerned with the commercialization of prostitution. So it's all the, all the other acts that are required in order to perform sex work that are criminalized. Now, that's not particularly a good thing either, but we know for sure um, that the ITPA, as interpreted by several high courts around the country, says very clearly that doing sex work per se is not a crime. And so the Bombay High Court has essentially reiterated that. And very importantly, has also referred us back uh, to Article 19 and our fundamental rights to say that these three women, in fact, had the freedom of movement to go wherever they wanted across the country. And because uh, they were adults, they could choose what kind of occupation they wanted to, to resort to. And in this case, if they chose voluntary sex work, then that was within their rights. And so I think this is a very, very important victory, I think, for the sex workers movement. And of course, the Bombay High Court has said the exact opposite in the bar dancing case. So, of course, you know, when a high court says it, you know, it could be again, would require some clarification from higher courts. But I think nevertheless, it's an important victory, especially at this time of the pandemic, where the rights of sex workers are likely to be undermined. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Kotiswaran, for providing us with the context in which sex trade operates in India and for raising some really interesting perspectives on the trade. Uh, I would request the attendees to post their questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens. Uh, I would now like to call upon Dr. Jana to address us. Thank you for inviting me uh, to join in this uh, discussion, uh, which is organized by the National Law University, Delhi. Uh, let me start with my experience uh, working with the sex workers. I think what Prova has explained the theories uh, which includes feminist and I think liberal groups and others. But what I learned working with them since 1992 uh, uh, is, a, is, a, is a story which uh, really can open up a uh, lot of issues uh, and theories which are put forward by different academicians. Uh, I started my work with the sex workers community uh, as a researcher 
as I I am a by profession I am a medical doctor and epidemiologist. So my task was to uh, develop some sort of uh, model of intervention which could reduce transmission of HIV among the sex workers and from sex workers to the uh, broad community. Uh, needless to say, this interest crops up uh, from the very basic idea that we have to protect the society from HIV, not out of love to sex workers. And from epidemiological point of view, sex workers are coined as core group transmitters. As a result of these, uh, I think, approach and attitude, to begin with, there is a lot of coercion, and in fact, um, uh, thousands of sex workers were rounded up in Mumbai, and they were put in a train to back to Chennai, which was coined as Mukti Express. But slowly, this attitude uh, gets changed due to various I think social reasons, but one of the important things was that sex workers slowly but steadily uh, could come up and uh, they could show how better uh, we could control the HIV transmissions. I think that played an underlying factor. So coming back to that story, interestingly, when we started this HIV intervention program, Unlike Prova or other academicians, I have no knowledge or any background information about sex workers. I also used to believe, uh, being a part of the mainstream society, that most of the sex workers are trafficked. Uh, they, they are uh, forced into the sex trade and uh, they, they should be removed from it. Uh, but within a couple of months' time, I started recognizing that this, this is uh, not the truth. Uh, as I started interacting with them, and not with one single sex worker, because during that time, my main task was, uh, other than teaching, was to develop a good program for the national government. So it was a quite uh, uh, heavily pressed. I was heavily pressed by the national government to look into this. So I had to go down with, in this red light district, visiting brothel to brothel and talk with them. So during this discourse, my whole belief and understanding started um, getting challenged by their views and opinion. Uh, and I started looking them just like any other human being uh, who for all obvious reasons, are engaged in some uh, livelihood options. They are like any other women in our society who, without having uh, any education or very little education and not ha having any sort of uh, sellable uh, skill in the market, uh, coming from a rural background to city background, they wanted to find out certain jobs where they can earn livelihood. And to them, slowly we could actually realize there are three, four options left to them. In Calcutta, for example, they can join as a domestic workers or they can join as a construction workers, more as a supporting staff. Third is the sex workers. I did work in Bangladesh also where we could find there was fourth option available in Dhaka for these women, which is the garment factory. And uh, most of them uh, tried from one to another. I mean, some may start with the domestic workers, then move to sex workers, or from sex workers to construction workers, and settle to one, one of them. <coughs> so uh, essentially, uh, they chose uh, based on their assessment and measurement, which is good for them. That's that's the basic fact of life. And if you say this is issue of choice, I should say choice is a social construct. And perhaps my range of choices, or say for example, a uh, range of choices for people who have good education, family background, social 
networks have more choices in contrast to a, a women coming from the rural background who has very little social network, no sort of a, a skill to sell in the market. So they have three, four options and out of which uh, they decide which one should be best for her. So the basic construct that they are forced into this sex work uh, is not really true and we rather proved later on when DMSC started their uh, anti-trafficking program through a unique mechanism which is uh, which they called as self-regulatory board. It is then a sort of board which, are, which is uh, chaired by local elected representative. He or she may be local councillors or a member of the legislative assembly and the secretarial job is taken care of by the uh, DMSC that is Durban Mahila Samanai Committee, the sex workers collective. And in this board, there are representations from the medical fraternity as well as from the legal fraternity. That means there is a medical doctor, there is a lawyer, and there are representations of sex workers from the HIV intervention program who are called as PR workers, that means sex workers, who are trained as a health workers and who know uh, who knows each and every things in and around sex work. And then in addition to there is representation from the children of the sex workers. And sixth or seventh member is the uh, someone who are, who has trafficked at points of time but now he is free and working there as sex workers or as a member of DMSC and others is also a member of this uh, self-regulatory board and it started functioning since 2001 onwards and on an average just I can give an example in Sonagachi itself uh, every year roughly uh, six to seven hundred new entrants are there. That means they are new in the sex work or they, they, they are new in the sonagachi. Uh, so the, the board, what it, talk, uh, what it does is very simple thing. Uh, there are uh, volunteers from the DMSC as well as PR workers who live in this red light districts. They uh, make daily visits, PR workers make daily visits in their locality besides the branch committee member of DMSC who actually uh, uh, visit both day and night to find out uh, many other issues, issue of violence, issue of uh, any conflict, to resolve any conflict between sex workers uh, or between sex workers and madams or be between sex workers and landlords and so on and so forth. And during these visits, even if they find a new face in this red light districts, where they, they remove her and put in a short stay home, which is only for maximum, they can put it for three days. And during that period, uh, she is counseled, her age is determined through X-ray examination because most of them do not carry any uh, birth certificate or anything else with them. And and this uh, counseling process uh, continues for more than one or two days if necessary, so as to find out uh, what is the truth behind uh, joining her in the sex work. And our data, which, uh, which is quite huge now, if you say last, um, say 15 years or so, uh, on an average, uh, in Calcutta alone, uh, have on an average, thousand new entrants are uh, identified, removed for a short span of time, and the process of counseling and identification or assessment of age is undertaken. And our data shows that less than 2% present is traffic, uh, means who join against their will. So what's our uh, reason? And this number has even fallen uh, in the last five years. It is less than 1%. Uh, and uh, in those cases, it is the simplest job for us because 
someone who is not interested to continue in the uh, sex work are taken back to their home with referral uh, with ref uh, accompanied by the sex workers uh, volunteers or or even uh, outreach workers uh, so that's that's one part of the story and in fact uh, when uh, i think prabha was uh, sharing about this um, supreme court constituted panel so one of the terms of reference was uh, how how we can actually reduce uh, trafficking in sex work that was one term of reference second was those who want to leave how better rehabilitation program to be made for them and third i think terms of reference perhaps not been uh, shared in this meeting but uh, but it is important also those who actually wish to continue in the work how their dignity could be maintained that was the third terms of reference but regarding this uh, 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 first terms of reference how anti trafficking program could be strengthened or how it could reduce the tra uh, uh, trafficking in sex work the supreme court panel after long debate and discussions agreed and recommended that similar they call it multi stakeholder board instead of self regulatory board should be uh, i think replicated to all the major cities in the country in fact that issue was again brought a few months back in this um, supreme court and the honorable judge asked the government uh, um, uh, lawyer the, why this uh, this uh, suggestion has not been implemented or or what is your view point and so on so forth uh, it, it happens in the month of uh, january then again in the month of march so government take uh, time to uh, give their responses and in the uh, and in the uh, march end then then we actually came up with uh, another issue which uh, provas here with you that due to covid uh, the situation in red light is i think it's the month of april Uh, has been uh, deteriorated they are living and uh, sort of uh, uh, condition has deteriorated so much that uh, some of them can go on hungry and so on so forth and supreme court should give some something some some support through national government or state or so i am not going into that uh, discussions which we i think supreme court gave a very strong sort of uh, a uh, uh, recommendation that uh, all sex workers should get uh, ration dry rations and transfer of cash without uh, asking papers to them uh, i think it is very important issue in the law itself that ipa law says that no one can give room on rent to sex workers which is a penal offense to landlord so as a result of which none of this landlord or landladies will uh, provide any uh, receipts of uh, uh, rent or any document based on which sex workers can prove his uh, residential address uh, in fact 99.9% sex workers in red light districts run their business through renting rooms but none of them has any residential proof for that as a result of which uh, whether to open up any bank account or to or to ask for any voter card means any citizenship identity card in addition to ration card is difficult for them to uh, acquire as because uh, for any documents to, to get any documents one has to prove his or her residence a residential to have to show to the government authorities uh, so it was uh, to a large extent resolved uh, particularly for voter card when dmsc uh, started uh, negotiating with the election commissioner in 2004 uh, it, it continued for 2 3 days also I mean 2 3 meeting was held with them that without having uh, being a citizen of the country Uh, why they can't uh, sort of get the rights to vote for 
so, so that was a debate and election commissioners state election commissioners at point agreed that it is his responsibility to see that each and every citizen should get the rights and they should actually exert their franchise so then the issue also came up how they could acquire their uh, voter card fortunately during that time uh, uh, the sex workers collective uh, uh, in calcutta uh, not because of voter card but because of their inability to access for uh, financial services which bank or in insurance without having this uh, identity means residential proof that they finally open up their own cooperative society which is known as usha cooperative society now they have more than 33000 members who actually save their money put their money and whenever necessary they could take loan which which has provided is a big help to them to to build their economic security so they are good that why can't uh, election commissioner accept this passbook of the usha cooperative society as the residential proof uh, to to issue the voter card so i think this this way we could uh, uh, i think durbar as the organizations could uh, manage to make uh, 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 voter card uh, to most of the sex workers in this red light districts so this is one area of interest when you look into this sex workers rights movement but i just like to deviate a little bit as as uh, pro actually shared uh, the views of uh, liberals and feminists and marriage and the sex work sort of thing so let me share one very interesting thing our study shows that at least in sonagachi uh, 67% of sex workers are ever married that means they were married at points of time and was forced to leave uh, because of uh, i think uh, domestic violence or similar other thing so uh, and they then uh, left their home with children or without children because 80% of them do have their children whether Uh, before joining sex work or after joining sex work and we carried out a very interesting study with a small sample of 200 sex workers uh, whom we actually chose from among who are married at points of time and was forced to leave and join in the sex work and another 200 who are not basically uh, 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 married before but the interesting part of the study was that these 200 sex workers who are married points of time uh, but finally join in the sex work so there are a lot of other questions but one of the important question was that how they judge their life before and after that means before and they join in the sex work when they were as a married women and what how they compare the present a uh, sort of quality of life freedom etc there was four five elements and 84% of them felt very strongly they are much better than how they actually uh, survived uh, as a married women okay but but i think one of the very important element which i trying to uh, come back in earlier discussions that how do we actually open up this pandora's box which are which is around sex work sex workers and so on so forth and when academicians sitting uh, i think uh, debating on these issues uh, which came open to us just visiting and talking and working with them and uh, i i feel very uh, amazed to share with you when you start this program then uh, we felt that for any hiv intervention program what should be the guiding principle in case of sex workers we had a debate among ourselves means our colleague in all india institute of hygiene and public health 
it is a premier public health institute where i used to teach epidemiology how we will approach to uh, the sex workers so most of them will go and uh, introduce to ourselves that's fine and the next phase how will actually introduce them they said no my brothers and my sisters and mothers and others i think that is a relational issue when we introduce ourselves as doctors or technical technician or outreach workers we introduce our professions our work and that's the social norms basically tomorrow when i introduce myself to prova i will not introduce uh, who is my father or who is my uh, cousin or others i will just talk about what we are doing and what you are doing at this moment so finally they said uh, well uh, then you please start the first meeting so i i just started my first discussions with a group of sex workers in a near brothel maybe there are some 14 15 of them then i we introduced ourselves and we expressed our objectives uh, that we like to reduce uh, hiv blah blah and how it could be and just like uh, i am a doctor i just introduced and i earn my livelihood by selling services by uh, treating patients giving pleasure or curing his or her illnesses similarly you people also are engaged in an occupation where you sell your pleasure sell pleasure to your clients and to my um, surprise there is a bit of silence within the group so i felt did i make any wrong comments or anything so again i tried to compose and reframe my points and communicated with them and it was interestingly enough there was no comment no sort of things so i felt a little uh, down and left this meeting after some 15 20 minutes uh, but it was uh, interesting next two to three weeks time not less than 50 to 60 sex workers came to me just to ask me what i said is it true or their her friends has actually uh, created this story around me or all these things so i naturally made my comment very straight forward and that actually opened up our entry into the sex workers it was so easy afterwards no uh, and later on i also asked them that uh, why you accept me and why you are so open to talk to me then it was interesting this year that we find a person uh, maybe in my lifetime in or 10 20 years in the sex work who said other than why you are not leaving this occupation it is a bad bad one it's a immoral one you should uh, uh, join in other work and so on so forth we are tired of listening all those things but it was quite interesting and refreshing to me that's why we wanted to know whether you really believe in that or you are saying something uh, you know, to to make someone happy or to make it happy i think this is very important lessons to us nowadays all these anti trafficking groups and others talk about um, uh, this uh, trafficking uh, uh, sort of how they are exploited blah blah all sorts of things Uh, but but who is actually reaching to them and how you actually communicate is a very important issue you see if you see sex work is a bad uh, sort of uh, sex workers are bad women fallen women uh, with this belief if you can uh, if you can approach to her and ask something then you will she will understand that what he wanted to listen from him because no one wanted to be further stigmatized by an outsider who will come and talk about how bad she is directly or indirectly not all researchers or any sort of uh, uh, community members uh, who, who met and uh, talk with sex workers directly utter that she is bad or fallen but all these discourses actually put her 
further into the corner who stand in the corner where she wanted to get some sort of uh, uh, i should say want to protect herself from getting further identified as a bad women and fallen women so she has to narrate a story uh, how she was brought into the sex worker it is not her will and so on so forth at least uh, to the uh, interviewer she can pose that she is not a bad woman she is not a fallen woman she is not a greedy woman so it, it's it's a very interesting relations over and over a period of time it's not that i learned it within the year time but it took longer uh, uh, today after 30 years i can confidently share with this talking with them means there was another interesting incidents also happened just one or two years after so when i used to sit with them most of the times other than hiv because it's become boring and monotonous so i used to ask what you do how many children you have and blah blah all sorts of things followed by why you come where from how you have reached to this uh, red light district so almost each and every one used to say uh, how they are actually misguided procured by someone blah blah all sorts of things so this happens uh, several times so after may maybe six five or six months after one such discourses when i sat with them perhaps i could remember the face she was might be beautiful to my eyes or something when she started another story you know i was quite angry so i said i could remember you you said in, in that house there the house numbers and others uh, on that month a different story how you have been brought, uh, how you came down to this sex work and now you are telling a different story then she started laughing so i was really angry i said you you said you told me lie and now now you are you are not only lying you are laughing at it so she started even then laughing and after uh, she stopped laughing i was angry i'm going uh, going to leave that uh, brothel then she says please please listen can you can you uh, ask, so tell me why i will tell good people i know many people are coming here and i if i tell if i share the truth are you going to uh, accept me like any other women in this society that i i came because of this reasons the truth is that yes i came earlier story or this story both are both we have actually after joining a sex work we started actually articulating one or other story so that that's the i i am talking much of the deeper issues of this uh, but 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 the most important element of it is that uh, women in our society na uh, when you are talking about another issue of low caste and why these dalits are there no my question is very simple uh, but in calcutta we didn't have that sort of study uh, because we didn't try to do that but it is the same issue no uh, how many uh, dalits women are in sort of a work which which is demeaning in our society you will see majority of them are there whether it is for for other workers whether it is uh, scavengers whether any other low paid and low status job status is an important issue uh, i find in most cases it is the caste and class are quite correlated here so raising this issue that only sex work only in sex work the leads are predominant i have a problem in that's that's one thing but i wanted to share something different but i time is so short uh, but i just share little bit of it because i think today uh, the issue has come uh, into the limelight about sex work and debate uh, and debate is going on about uh, whether it is a work or not but this has happened as because sex workers in india particularly 
not just DMHC, but many other sex workers collective has come up and could raise their voices. So you have, you cannot ignore that voice and cannot impose that. That's a very interesting thing. Just before finishing, I just had two, three lines, how we have evolved DMHC over the period of time where we succeeded in partnering HIV. That's, that's, that's a foregone story which showed to the world that how sex workers collectivizations and ownership building over the program development and implementation can make difference. Uh, and now all across the world in HIV world, whether it is national government, whether it is international agencies, whether it is UN agencies, all accepted that sex, uh, any, any marginalized community, uh, ownership is very important in disease control program. They have to be empowered. They have to be collectivized. And in fact, National HIV AIDS program not only accepts it, it has been budgeted. That means there is money to collectivize sex workers, to build their capacity, to run their offices, so on and so forth. But one major change is what we have observed over the period, which um, could help uh, Prabhat to see further also, that uh, when you started, when DMSC started this program, they wanted to make uh, alliances beyond sex workers collectives and others, which is a, which they started from the very beginning and they get a good um, number of uh, academicians, literary drawings of this city, which make a difference. And they also could uh, influence uh, media personals here. But when they try to engage with the women's collectives, women's group, whether they, they are aroused feminist or not, most of them rejected sex workers. I am talking about 95, 96, 97. And uh, they, then, then they started actually changing their uh, sort of uh, strategies to engage more with the, uh, in, uh, I think, informal labor sector. And by 2007 and 8, there's a huge change in the, in the state of West Bengal when the major, I think, informal labor sector organizations not only accepted sex workers, even accepted their leadership. In the state of West Bengal, there is a, a union of uh, uh, informal labors, which uh, includes 17 different occupational groups, like farmers, domestic workers, blah, blah, all sorts of things which represent voices of 100,000 uh, women workers in the state. And that forum is headed by uh, joint convener. One of them is sex workers. They're running. And second, the important things which has happened in the recent past, means last three, four years, the women's group who used to, I think, uh, distance from the sex workers like DMSC, now they are coming up their own women who are, who are, who are uh, fighting against domestic violence, who are against uh, gender-based violence. At least major women's collectives in state of West Bengal invited DMSC to be part of their forum. So it shows, uh, these are I think silver lining, and it shows if you continue to engage with these people, uh, it will uh, bound to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jana, for that insightful account. Uh, Darbar has and continues to champion sex workers' rights, and uh, success of initiatives like this is a hope in this fight, and we congratulate Darbar for it. Uh, we shall now move on to questions from the audience. Uh, I think Professor Koti Swaran has disconnected. She'll be joining soon. So Dr. Jana, I will uh, address the first question to you, which is that in the context of one of the films by your organization, Darbar, by the name of Sona Gachir Ek Yuk Shootings, 
please excuse my pronunciation, uh, which seeks to uh, turn upside down the rules and norms of sex workers' lives and profession and sort of holds a carnival to celebrate their journey by showing how inadequate the morality-based discourse is. So how do you view this emergence of a new discourse that sort of defies this stigma related to sex work by celebrating their rights of pleasure in public, something that is analogous to the Marxist analysis of labor and production as discussed by Professor Kotiswaran in her writings as well. So this is a question addressed to both of you is that how do you view the, this new emerging discourse? I think this is extremely important because you see, Sex work and workers' issue cannot be dissociated with sex, pleasure, sex and pleasure. So, so if their uh, occupation is accepted as a as an occupation through which they provide pleasure to a section of clients, then why they should not really uh, engage into celebrating this? And they actually argue at points of time that well, when when someone sells some services, because in a marketing economy, you can buy everything. Even the most important issue like for living, water is so Food, you have to buy in the market. So selling pleasure, what's wrong into that? We are not killing people. We are not driving people. We are not doing anything which is known socially injustice or uh, we are giving pleasure, and pleasure, I think, we always, each and every individual wants to enjoy their life through one or another kind of pleasure. And sexual pleasure is the highest level of pleasure, and we provide it. So we should be respected as a service provider, then should be stigmatized. And so we should enjoy our life and occupation. Uh, Professor Kotiswaran, my next question is to you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, your video is, I think. Yes, I, I got dropped off. And so I think I'm back in again. Just give me a second. Yes, um, I'm trying to turn it on, but go ahead. I can hear you so I can answer the question okay. and I'll try to. So this is an argument that is usually put in favor uh, when arguing for essentially partial criminalization, at least criminalization of sex work. And that is a recurring argument that we have been receiving in the questions as well, is that that sex radical feminists sort of assume a very utopian or perfect image of sex trade. However, uh, sex trade essentially operates in the backdrop of a patriarchal society where essentially no woman is really free to make her own choices and sex workers are at an even more disadvantaged position. So uh, how so there is need for special state intervention that arises because of this uh, disadvantaged position. So how do you respond to this argument? Yeah, I think I just want to say, I'm sorry, I might have missed uh, some of the interventions by Dr. Jana. Um, but I just want to say that uh, the whole thrust of the Indian sex workers movement has been to actually show that sex work is not exceptional in any way to other occupations in the informal economy. Um, and I think I can say this with some confidence because the, the part of the project that I'm now managing looks at uh, women's work across several sectors. So we are looking at sex work, we're looking at bar dancing, we're looking at surrogacy, uh, we're looking at paid domestic work, and we're looking at the work of housewives. And in fact, um, you know, I, I appreciate that there might be some unique features of, you know, uh, selling sexual services. I understand that. But it's not clear that sex work is exceptional when compared to all these other forms of women's work. If anything, in fact, for example, you know, in the wake of the pandemic, if you look at the way that domestic workers have been treated, you know, where they've not been paid for months, um, you know, either. So if you look at the way that the employers treat them or if you look at the way the state has treated them, the fact that you can have migrant domestic workers living, uh, you know, in a different state for 40 years and not have a ration card, live in informal settlements where, you know, state services don't reach them. I think there's just a considerable level of similarity. I mean, police brutality, for example, it seems that during the pandemic, you know, it was the brutality of the police against the migrants that was just so visible 
to a lot of us. And that's exactly what sex workers go through. If anything, you know, I actually find that today, if you had a conversation on sex work, it would be rare not to have a sex worker herself come and speak about sex work. You know, it would be very hard to do the same for other sectors. The domestic workers, yes, with some difficulty, you can find them. Surrogates, almost invisible. So in fact, I would think that sex workers are, are at the vanguard of worker struggles. Um, and so uh, I, I actually think that the state can do more by doing less, which is by enforcing laws against sexual violence, for sure. But removing, you know, repealing laws like the ITPA, which are actually being adversely used against sex workers and, you know, undermining their bargaining power vis-a-vis, -vis, say, you know, the brothel keeper or the client or the, you know, the lal um, and the police. So I, I hope that answers your question, but I'm, I'm happy to, you know, uh, go into further detail. Uh, Ma'am, just to follow up question from that. Yeah that emerges uh, from this theory of intersectionality. So like, how do you assess the role of poverty and especially caste in structuring the sex industry? And uh, particularly if you talk about practices of intergenerational prostitution in among many communities in India. So uh, how do you see this and still argue for presence of agency of sex workers? Yeah, I think to, to some extent, I think I agree with Dr. Jana, which is what he just said, uh, which is that, you know, there are various occupations. Again, the point is that sex work is not exceptional in any way. So caste is fundamental to the way occupations are structured in India. Uh, certain occupations are deeply problematic. There is just absolutely no question about it. But I'm not sure, again, that sex work is exceptional in any way. You know, if that is the case, right, if uh, if caste, uh, you know, justice in terms of caste is what we're looking for, then we should also then criminalize domestic work. Because in fact, large sections of domestic workers, you know, come from lower caste. So the question is to really, you know, without denying the significance of caste, I think we have to think towards, you know, what would be our response to, uh, you know, to that reality of, uh, you know, lower caste uh, men and women who are stuck in certain kinds of occupations. And I think on the caste-based uh, occupation, again, I think, uh, you know, there are lots of changes, uh, you know, which you see in these occupations. Um, and there's a very different equation between marriage and, uh, you know, uh, sex work in those contexts. So if you're looking at the media community, for example, uh, you know, sometimes there's, uh, there is also uh, odd courtesans uh, in Lucknow that, you know, Veena Oldenburg wrote about. Um, there are some very fundamental uh, uh, there's a lot of resistance to the uh, heterosexual idea of, you know, of patriarchal marriage. So I think we can think of these sites not just as perpetuating certain forms of caste-based, uh, you know, um, occupations, but also as forms of resistance to what we think of as, you know, uh, hegemonic. Uh, my next question is addressed to both of you is that how do you view the silence of Indian women movement with respect to sex work and the general silence of the popular Indian women's movement towards it? Dr. Jana, you can begin. Yeah, I think uh, that's why I shared my last uh, part of my uh, discourse that, um, well, I think the women's movement, I think... Uh, probably better to uh, characterize the women's movement in the country. But if you say that uh, informal labor women are also women, and they do movement for their occupation, their livelihood. From that perspective, the, uh, the moment sex workers came up and uh, tried to engage them, they received good support from them. So that shows the women's movement which are primarily uh, headed by the middle class women in our country who uh, trust more on morality than on rights. I am not talking in general but I think there is an issue of it. So it is the moral issue which, uh, which prevent them to engage with the sex workers. But things are changing slowly uh, and I hope it will, it will change in near future also. 
Right. Yeah, I, I think I just want to, yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Jana. I think, um, like I said, I think the complex sort of feminist traditions that the Indian women's movement draws on, I think has meant that it has not embraced directly, you know, the cause of uh, sex workers' rights, nor has it gone the path of radical feminists, say, in the U.S., where they're very keen to, you know, abolish sex work by criminalizing customers, because once you criminalize any party to the transaction, you're actually going to hurt sex workers as well. So I think, but the problem actually is that the, what it has meant then is that the Indian women's movement has abdicated more or less, at least historically speaking, the space of the sex work debates. And that has meant then that the, the that advocacy space has been reserved for, or has come to be occupied by, you know, conservative uh, nationalist groups, NGOs mostly, or uh, you know small radical feminist NGOs that then have become uh, you know have engaged extensively in raids, rescue, and rehabilitation missions, and that means that they have become repeat players vis-a-vis -vis the state, and therefore the state has then drawn on them as experts on this question. And so you know I think there were a lot of questions around the process of lawmaking and. Uh, what we find is that it's because these so-called expert NGOs were invited to the table every time when it came to drafting the trafficking law, uh, that we have a trafficking law that doesn't resonate with the lived experiences of either trafficked persons or of sex workers. So I think the, so the, the legacy of the Indian women's movement on this question has been deeply problematic. But at the same time, I think of late, certainly since 2013, you know, there has been support for sex workers' rights. You know, it's just that it's not, uh, you know, at the center, it's not at the heart of uh, the Indian women's movement. Much more focus has been on, you know, say, dealing with sexual violence or, or uh, rape law reform rather than, you know, questions of, uh, you know, sexual minorities like sex workers. Uh, moving to the last question, which is also addressed to both of you, is that what factors do you think that uh, are creating a lack of participation of sex workers in the policy decisions and having experience uh, working with sex workers and the sex workers' rights? What do you think is the way ahead to ensuring this kind of participation of sex workers in policy decisions? I think this is one of the major struggle what all sex workers collective across the country is trying to uh, is facing at this moment because I think the common uh, sort of uh, understanding at least which came up in connection to HIV program or that those who are at the receiving end they should be part of the policy making bodies whether it is for HIV program whether it is for any issue which is pertaining to the sex workers, be it rehabilitation or any sort of development program, it should be uh, represented by the said community, which we have been pushing since, I think, last 15, 20 years, at points, um, HIV intervention program uh, managers, I think, national government and state government accepted sex workers representations that's why in NACO or in state level there are sex workers representation but unfortunately uh, women and child uh, ministry of women and child welfare or development uh, refused to accept sex workers representations because they do not accept the word sex workers that is what has been shared by the lawyers collectively because they had their representation. This is unfortunate and these unfortunate things are happening and being repeated as because I feel there is a general, I think mainstream society has still a lot of taboos, a lot of, uh, I think, um, uh, stigma they, they put uh, in sex workers or just like you see. I see the similarities between how these Dalit women are wrapped in one set of, in one kind of things which is happening. The same way, uh, another kind of women who are in their uh, sex work are directly or indirectly uh, refuse to uh, uh, get their present or refuse to seek with the policy-making bodies 
but the same arrogance same attitude towards the women in sex or I think I completely agree with Dr. Jana. I, did, uh, I think he's articulated all the obstacles to sex workers being included. And I think I try to suggest that there should be more community-based law reform initiatives where communities themselves, rather than, you know, taking what we have and going to the community, I'd go even further to say, you know, identify the demands of the community and the needs of the community to actually then arrive at, you know, law reform. And I think generally to... Um, bolster all the sort of democratic processes we need for lawmaking, which is the fact that, you know, drafts of laws should be made publicly available at all points uh, so that there's consultations, uh, you know, including with the community all over the country, because the realities are quite different even in relation to sex work, you know, where there are red light areas in certain parts of the country, uh, but most street-based sex work in the South, for example. So to account for all the variations uh, you know, in the way that the sector is is organized, uh, but also through, you know, as much pre-legislative consultation as possible, but also during the legislative process through reference to committees, uh, to parliamentary uh, committees, um, and also having some kind of audit of the unintended consequences of any given law, you know. Um, so I think, I think there just, it has to be multifaceted, this, this idea of uh, consultation. Just one, I, I but the interesting the Supreme Court constituted panel, which uh, we shared, uh, I think, global. They accepted uh, sex workers with the recognition and it was vehemently opposed by some anti trafficking group, but uh, I think uh, that was uh, really good as the uh, Supreme Court uh, didn't uh, listen to them, but felt that we are discussing on sex workers issues. So there should be sex workers representative. Uh, before closing, Dr. Jana, just one follow-up question to that. How has the state responded to your initiatives? Like, how is... Yeah. I, I, regarding COVID. Yes, yes, specifically. Yeah, I think, um, in fact, um, uh, DMSC did a splendid job, I should say. They basically worked in three sort of, um, uh, three strategies they adopted. One was that how to influence na state government to ensure uh, sort of dry rations or cash transfer to the sex workers, for which they essentially involved the uh, International Advisory Committee, which was constituted by the Chief Minister of West Bengal, headed by this Nobel laureate, this OBD Pinar Kanati. And we could reach out to him and to him basically, he pushed very strongly even before the, uh, the Supreme Court judgment came up that uh, all sex workers should be provided with by naming that uh, without any sort of uh, papers and others. So that was one sort of thing. Secondly, actually, uh, DMC has, uh, I, I think, well organized uh, advocacy group and others. They meet with the different um, uh, food departments and all, so that 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 actually helps to <coughs> get several response from them. Second, it was also important for brothel based sex workers. The second strategy was that during these uh, sort of uh, lockdown period, they won't be able to pay the rent because their earning is uh, almost nil. So they had a very hard negotiations with the landlords and others to web uh, rent for sex workers at least for three months, which they uh, succeeded. Thirdly, they themselves organized, uh, I think, uh, rations to sex workers, uh, and uh, which started from second April onwards until today. It's not one-time job. They could fetch at least 30,000 sex workers all across the, uh, of course, North Bengal, they can reach out for different, uh, uh, not for train and others, but uh, uh, they could actually reach out to these 30,000 plus sex workers with dry ration almost uh, with 10 to 12 days interval so that none can go hungry. 
that's that one thing. And fourth one, this um, Supreme Court sort of uh, things, which uh, lawyers collective help them to uh, put their documents. <coughs> so uh, I, I think you have to open up all different fronts. And uh, when I said that uh, this this four months, uh, this last six months, they could provide these dry rations, not because they, uh, from their fund supported it, they could mobilize hundreds of individuals and organizations, 100 plus organization who came up with their call, submitted uh, food, uh, groceries, everything. Almost every other day we got one or other uh, point of uh, persons or organizations all together and also cash. Uh, more than, I think, 150 individuals have supported in cash and 100 plus organizations because they have a trust in DMSC and they felt that giving DMSC will make um, really reach these things to the top. I think so as a result of which uh, uh, I think they could really uh, turn around this uh, table uh, which is uh, against them. And most interesting part what Prabha said I forgot to share with you that when this Yale and Harvard University came up with this big data, you know, active Prova was very strong enough to mm, contest these sort of things. We, uh, and you see, today, at least six months down the line, in Calcutta, where there are more than 20,000 sex workers, still that we have only three cases of COVID. When you see national level, Calcutta level, it uncomparable. Because the same PR workers were used to address COVID and they reach out to sex workers and they have a strong trust and confidence. So accordingly they behave very differently unlike even many educated people in the city Calcutta. Um, I want to thank Professor Prabha Kutiswaran and Dr. Jana for, for this engaging and insightful discussion. It is important that more meaningful conversations are initiated around sex workers' rights, and I sincerely hope that initiatives like this contributes to it. We thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks.